going to begin a new series of messages. Uh, they're entitled, That's a Good Question. And as we consider this series, those of you who are worshiping in our sanctuary, you can raise your hand, and there's probably a way electronically for those of you worshiping up our live stream to do the same thing. How many of you have either asked or been afraid to ask in case someone would say that your question was a stupid question. How many of you have asked a stupid question? Look at that. Almost everyone in the sanctuary. Let me tell you about my stupid question. Because my stupid question beats everybody's stupid question. I want you to picture me 40 years ago. Um, in university, sitting in a university class in a small Bible college in Moncton. Um, professor's name was Jim, Jim Beverly. The course was Cults and World Religions. And we were studying in this class this, uh, the different texts that world religions have. And um, I wanted to ask a real, real a good question that would show just how much I was paying attention and just how smart that I was. I was sitting in the back of the class, and uh, so I put up my hand and uh, asked the question. And what I meant to say was, my question was meant to be, what do all the other scholars say about these versions of the holy books? That was supposed to be my question. But I was nervous. I was new at the university scene, and I was extremely nervous, and you'd never know it today, but found it difficult to talk in public. And so when I put up my hand and asked the questions, what came out was, what do all these other virgins think of this translation? <laughs> the entire class erupted in laughter. My face turned redder than a sunburn could have caused it. And the professor was speechless. He, he, he stood at the class. He didn't want to laugh because he was the one who taught. No stupid questions. Well, I think I redefined that that day. Stupid questions. Well, this morning in this series, as we begin, I want to remind you that there's really no such thing as a stupid question. To get today, we're going to look at perhaps the greatest question that was ever asked the greatest question that was ever asked. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture here for you to help you put this into context. And they are taken from Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Greg, oh, there we go. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling, trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. What was the greatest question that was ever answered? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? The, great, the greatest question and the greatest answer ever given. Let's put this in a, in a little bit of context for you. Paul was preaching, traveling through the Holy Land. He came to a city called Philippi. And in Philippi, he had the opportunity to preach and saw what historians today would call a revival. In particular, there was a woman, her name was Lydia. She was a seller of purple cloth, very wealthy. She heard the message, and she reached out to Jesus as her own personal Lord and Savior. Paul and Silas continued to preach, and lives were radically changed. One of the people who heard their message was a fortune teller. Yes, they even had those back in the first century. And we're told that this fortune teller 
got her power because she was possessed of an evil spirit. We would call that demon-possessed today. And this evil spirit gave her the ability to predict futures and to predict it accurately. When Paul was preaching, evidently Paul understood in his spirit that this woman need to be healed. And so he went and cast out that evil spirit and she was healed, which was good. The bad thing was for the person that owned her services because she was no longer useful to him and could no longer, no longer could she turn a profit for him. And so these men, these men who had used her for their own profit were angry. And so they went to the leaders, the magistrates, the, the governing authority, and they complained that this man, Paul, and his sidekick, Silas, are turning the whole world into an uproar. Now, that must have been a little bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, there's part of me as a preacher that says that I wish somebody had accused me of that because of the results of my ministry. The whole city was in an uproar. The real truth was these people were mad because Paul cost them a fortune. That was the real reason. And so they had Paul and Silas arrested. And it wasn't just enough that they were arrested. They took off the robes that they were wearing and the garments that were underneath of them so that their bare backs were showing. And they got them to bend over and they took rods, heavy sticks, and they beat both Paul and Silas over and over and over again because they did nothing more than preach the gospel that changed people's lives. And if that wasn't enough, they had them thrown into the jail. And they got a jailer, and they literally threatened the jailer. You watch these two, and you watch them close. Do not let them escape. Well, many of you know the rest of the story that it just so happened that that night that there was a real bad earthquake, a real, real bad earthquake. But I'm getting ahead of myself in the story because Paul and Silas, you would think that these two wounded men who were thrown in jail would be having the, the type of prayer time, God, why did you let this happen to us? Why, when we were having such good results from our ministry, why did you let us get thrown in jail? But Paul and Silas, you know the story well. They didn't do that, did they? You know what they did? They sang the days of Elijah. They sang my lighthouse. And they sang, sang the sound of the saints. Well, it wouldn't have been in English. They would have had Greek language, but they sang hymns. They sang first century hymns. And they prayed to God. Now think about that for a second. How was that possible? Now I would, as a preacher, I would have loved the results that they were having from the preaching, but I wouldn't want that type of suffering. And I suspect that you wouldn't want it either. But Paul and Silas, they were able to see the bigger picture of what God was accomplishing. And right there in the midst of their singing, right there in the midst of their praying, that earthquake hit. And that earthquake was so strong that it wrecked the jail. The gates fell open because of the earthquake and all of the prisoners began to escape. The jailer ran to see what was going on. And there he found that there were two prisoners. The ones that he was threatened to make sure were secure, they were still there. That jailer, let's understand how desperate he was. He knew what future what his future looked like. He didn't need a fortune teller to predict it. He knew that he would be punished and punished cruelly 
and even put to death cruelly because these men escaped. And in his mind was, instead of dying in a horrible manner, what I'm going to do is just take my own life. Long before it was a proverbial saying, he was literally going to fall on his sword and take his own, own life because that was easier than what his future was. And when he went there, there was Paul and Silas. They never went anywhere. They never went anywhere when they could have escaped. And that made a deep, deep impression on that Philippian jeweler, jailer, sorry, Philippian jailer. That made a profound impression upon him. You know what? He realized there's something to this message that Paul and Silas are preaching. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit who worked in our lives helping us to understand the truth of God's Word, the Holy Spirit that gives us enlightenment to understand what other people thought is foolish, he gave the same thing to this jailer. And now the man who had heard the message outside the jail, now all of a sudden it rang true. And he asked the greatest question that was ever asked. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Have you asked that question today? You know, people answer that question in different ways. Some would think that their own personal salvation is, is work-based that I'm going to do as much good as I can possibly do in my life so that God will notice me. And maybe the good that I do will outweigh the bad that I do on the scale, and I will just work hard enough to get into heaven. And those people will worry the whole life through, did I do enough that God will let me in heaven? The Apostle Paul addressed people who believe that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and he tells us that we're saved by faith, not by works. That salvation by works is doomed to fail. There are others, I guess, who would answer that question by saying, saved, salvation is universal. Everybody's going to heaven. It doesn't matter whether you worship Jesus or Buddha, whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a secularist. Everybody goes to heaven. But John reminds us in John 14 that Jesus once said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Salvation is far from universal. The invitation is universal, but not all accept the invitation. There are others who believe that if they adhere to the law, that they will be saved. If they adhere to the law as it's written in the Ten Commandments, as they have adhere to the civil law, as they treat their neighbor properly, that they will be saved. But Jesus said, be perfect even as I am perfect. And we know that all fall short of such a high standard. Finally, I suppose that there are still some who would believe that salvation comes through a particular enlightenment, that somehow we gain knowledge that no one else had. In the first century, that was alive and well, a knowledge Gnostics, Gnosis, was supposed to be special knowledge that these people had. And there are still people from, that follow um, Eastern practices that would believe that we can have that special knowledge and that will be saved. But do you know, when Paul and Silas answered the jailer, 
They never gave any of those four false statements. They gave one true statement. And that true statement was simply this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That word belief is the same Greek word that's translated faith or trust. It's the Greek word pistos and it, and it means to lay your life before another recognizing that he has done everything that's required. Wow. That's hard for people to accept. It's hard today and it was hard in the first century when Paul spoke it. What do you mean? I don't need to do anything? I just need to trust that someone has done it all for me? If Paul were standing here today, he would say, yes, that is what happened. God did it all for you and me. God did it all for you and me. And all that we need to do is believe. Believe that since we were rebels, since sin had tainted our lives, we no longer could enter into God's presence. There was nothing that we could do to change that fact. So God did something. He took the form of human flesh and came and lived among us. The only one who never sinned paid the penalty. And so we believe that when Jesus died, he died not because he was a criminal, for he did nothing wrong. He died to pay the penalty for the wrong that we have done. And folks, that is more than good news. That is more than a myth. It's more than a fairy tale. It's the truth. And we are called to trust and accept and believe. That message is so life-changing. It brings us so much joy that we are going to share it with others. That we are going to share that truth with other people. Maybe you ask the question, well, how do I know where other people stand with God? If I am to be like the Apostle Paul and, and share the truth with others, if I am to invite others to believe, how do I know where they stand? How can I diagnose their spiritual condition? Sometimes uh, when we are suffering uh, physically, We'll go to the doctor, and the doctor will run a, a series of tests so that we can, so that he or she can get a diagnosis of what's wrong with us and then be able to treat it. And so we wonder how can we diagnose the spiritual condition of other people to know where they're at? Years ago, a pastor, James Kennedy, in a church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Coral Ridge actually, came up with two questions that people have been asking others for years and years and years. Two questions that will help diagnose their friends' spiritual conditions. And you can see those questions that are on the screen today that continue to be true. If you were to appear before God today and God would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? D. James Kennedy family asked that question that many people would say, because the good that I do, the good that I do outweighs the bad that I've done. And he would tell them, I have good news. In fact, I have great news for you. It's not all about what you've done. It's what God has done. For some people, the very thought that you are to invite others to believe even as you believe is enough to make your knees knock and your hands shake. And yet, 
We are called to share the truth. Something like one beggar showing another beggar where they have found food. And we do that not by standing on a soapbox and preaching, but we do that when we ask good questions of other people and listen attentively to what they say, showing that we care because Jesus cares. You know, it's not just the paid professionals. It's not just the ordained pastors. It's not just the evangelists. It's not just the TV and internet shows. It's our responsibility to live out our faith. When Jesus came to earth, the theologians called that the incarnation, God in flesh. And you know that you and I get to incarnate the message through our lives with others. We get to live it out so that others can see the faith that changed our lives and that through asking good questions, we can share the truth with others. Wouldn't it be neat if we asked a good question like the ones on the screen and someone said to us, well, what must I do to be saved? There's a temptation to say, well, let me give you my pastor's telephone number. He'll tell you what to do. But my hope and my desire through this series of messages is that you will become well-trained so that you, no matter how nervous you will be, will realize that God's Spirit can use your word to help another person become one step closer to the kingdom. Hudson Taylor was a former missionary from a, a bygone era. Quite a remarkable person, actually. And you know what he pointed out? He pointed out that being a witness for Jesus, sharing your faith by asking good questions is not some type of religious option. It's not like I can share my faith or I can go work in the church bazaar. It's not like I can share my faith or I can go be a deacon. It's not like I can share my faith or I can serve on the church board. It's all of us living for Jesus, asking good questions, pointing people towards the kingdom. And that more of us who are involved in that process, the greater the kingdom will expand. You see, Hudson Taylor was on something. On to something, not on something. Sorry, that has a completely different connotation, doesn't it? <laughs> Hudson Taylor was on to something when he said, it's a command. It's one of those things that Jesus tells us to do that's difficult and we would sooner ignore it. You know, the difficult commands of Jesus, love your neighbor, be nice to those who don't use you well, pray for your enemies, give 10% of your income to the church, and now share your faith even if you, for you, like Paul and Silas, it can cause you. As we wrap things up this morning, I just want to remind you of one thing. If you were a beggar that wanted to show another beggar where to find food, there's one thing that would be necessary first. Think about that. If you were going to show another where they could find food, what's the thing that's required first? You would have had to first find it yourself. You would have had to first find it yourself. You couldn't send them to some hypothetical spot to go and look and say, yeah, there's For your words to be authentic and real and helpful, you would have to be able to say, I dined there yesterday. There was food. And the same thing is true in our spiritual lives. 
if we are going to ask good questions, to diagnose where other people are with Jesus, to point them to the kingdom of God, to witness and share of what Jesus has done in our life, it's going to require that Jesus has done something in our life. And so I ask you today, have you asked this question yourself? Have you personally said, what must I do to be saved? And have you received the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved? you shall be saved. Have you trusted in Jesus knowing that God did something for you that is truly remarkable? This morning, if you haven't received Jesus by believing on him, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Those of you who are in our audience, I invite you to bow your heads. Those who are watching online can do the same. And quietly within yourself, you can pray this prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus, I've often asked that question, what must I do to be saved? I have tried to earn my own salvation by hoping that the good would outweigh the bad in my life. But today you have reminded me again as if for the first time, that you've done everything and all that I need to do is believe. And so today I trust in you that you paid the penalty and I ask that you would be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I invite you to come and talk to Pastor Nigel or, or me uh, this week. Uh, maybe you'll want to rush right home and uh, join the Zoom class, or those of you who are online may want to stay and dive deeper uh, into discussing this topic. We want to resource you so that you will be able to follow Jesus the rest of your life. Now, until we gather again to worship together, I pray that God would bless you, that God would keep you safe, and that God would continue to teach you his word. Amen.